Welcome to the Cabin Culture Podcast, where we spend a little more time diving deeper into all the fun parts of cabin culture. We like to think of this as both the material and imagined expressions of how cabin lovers, dwellers, builders, and designers wish to live a more simple and authentic life. On today's episode, we are talking to Isaac French, who is the dreamer, the founder, and the former host at Live Oaks Lake outside Waco, Texas. This episode is an interesting one, especially for those hoping to do something bigger than a one or two cabin creation. In fact, Isaac dreamt of a whole property of tiny cabins and made that happen in an astonishing nine months. On this episode, he shares how the dream came to life, how much they made in their first year, and the masterclass he's created about experiential hosting. I really enjoyed learning about an experience so wildly different from my own, and yet there is still so much in common. This one is definitely not to be missed by anyone with big dreams who need a little mix of inspiration combined with how-to. Let's do it. Okay, well, I'm excited to chat with you because I don't know how familiar you are with the podcast, but the majority of our guests, I feel like, are individuals like myself who might have built one cabin or started hosting in one cabin, might have moved to a second or third but your model is a little bit different in that you kind of started right away with a big piece of land and building seven small cabins on it, which is a little bit different than what we're used to. You also have a background in building, which a lot of people ask questions about and I have no experience in. Um, but I, before we dive into all that, I want to like take it back further and just find out, can you start by telling me what your introduction to cabin culture was? When did this all start for you? So I was in construction and building for about six years working in a family business. And that gave me an incredible opportunity to learn the trades from the ground up, literally. Um, and I also had a pretty intense passion for art and architecture from a very early age, very early age. My grandma would give us art lessons from the time I was six years old and up. I wanted to be an architect when I was younger, but um, wasn't really willing to <laughs> put in the discipline of going to school for that long. And so I just started collecting ideas. I loved the cabin concept. I grew up in Texas till I was 12 years old. And then our family moved to the Pacific Northwest where I lived for like a decade. And living up there in the kind of North Central Idaho region, Eastern Oregon and Washington, I noticed there was a lot of Nordic inspired architecture and mm -hmm. cabins specifically that just I, I really loved. And we didn't really have that in Texas. And long story short, I moved back to Texas uh, a few years ago in 2020 and realized, hey, this is a perfect opportunity to maybe bring some of that Scandinavian design to Texas. And so I just had this idea to create this village of like Nordic inspired cabins and kind of bring that vibe with the lake, with the water and um so it it happened so organically it, it's hard to like um pin down when the idea first happened i think it was just like the culmination of all of these different passions that i had and experiences and kind of being influenced by all that design so yeah we could jump right into the story of how live oak came to be or if there's anything else on the cabin topic yeah well i'm just intrigued i'm gonna jump into because i'm gonna jump into live oak in a second but I feel like we mostly interview, because this is where a lot of cabins and cabin culture we find in the US, Pacific Northwest, New England, and then if in the South, it's in the mountains. So it feels like there have to be these elements of either cold weather, where you have like a wood stove and getting snowed in, or mountains and views and forests. And when I think of Texas, <laughs> I don't think of any of these things. So I'm wondering, did you see a need for this in Texas? Or did you like, did you see people craving cabin culture and like, oh, okay, I can meet this need because it doesn't really exist here? Or was it more like, I'm going to introduce people to this thing that they might not have experienced otherwise? I think it was a lot more of the latter. So having that experience firsthand and, um, really just one thing I think that, you know, we all have different gifts and strengths and weaknesses. And I think one of my strengths is that I can be very um, decisive in a good way about like curating tastes and experiences that I like and that mm -hmm. other people will probably resonate with too, instead of sort of like waiting to kind of figure out what people want or what some trend is. And so yeah. having all those different experiences and then kind of having this architectural aesthetic in mind, 
I firmly believed without much data, even in terms of could the local market support the concept I had, or would they like that? Would they appreciate that style of architecture? I just firmly believed this is cool. This is an experience that I love and that I've seen other people love too. And I don't see it here. So really with that kind of personal conviction, I was able to take a, a huge risk as a 24 year old and launch the project a few years ago. That's what's so crazy to me because I feel like my background is in I, I spent some time in the startup world and and investors would never give the advice of like, like all the advice is like, find out what users want and then create what they want. And it feels like you did the opposite of that. And you were like, no, I know what they need. So I'm going to bring that to them. But most, most folks giving business advice be like, that is not the way to start a business. And we'll get to this next, but like, you've been very successful at this. So I'm curious, like, what would your advice be for other people? Would you recommend this for other people? Or do you think you just got lucky? I mean, I don't really believe in luck, so I'm not saying that, <laughs> that there isn't a lot of like skill and execution here, but what advice would you give other people thinking about this? Yeah, I think that when it boil, what it boils down to is, yes, yeah, so you have to have a vision that is going to succeed and that's hard to put your finger on. I think some people have it and some people don't. And everybody again has like strengths and weaknesses. So maybe you have a lot of like the technical or execution or business skills that are needed to execute a vision like this, but you don't necessarily have the creative and the visionary. Well, maybe there is somebody that you trust or you know, or that you resonate with that you could partner with. So there's always that opportunity, but somebody has to have that vision that they believe in. And then I think both of you, if you're partnering or if that's you, you've got to believe in it and like 110 mm. percent and that's mm. going to be critical for so many people ask me like where do i start because since sharing the project and now creating this community and masterclass, there's a lot of folks i've been able to help and and just connect with network learn from a lot of folks that are you know in similar to in a similar place to where i was two or three years ago just say mm -hmm. look i've got i've got the vision or i i've got the inspiration but i don't have the money that's the biggest that's the biggest setback for most people and yes, this is somewhat of a challenging um, capital environment to raise money in, but I have tons of people that I've worked with and myself personally that I can speak from experience. When you have that vision and you can share it with passion and conviction, people will gravitate towards that. And there, now there's a lot of case studies, um, even you know, of single unit, but also multi-unit properties, like you mentioned, that serve as just incredible kind of like collateral that this this idea does yes. work but i would just say that there's my personal philosophy on like choosing markets and choosing a concept really is kind of contrarian it's it's about finding places that are off the beaten path that are sort of forgotten that seem boring in a sense like even naturally in terms of what's huh. there you mentioned northeast pacific northwest there's obviously a ton of awesome awesome landscape and just outdoor experience there it would be my dream, yeah, to <laughs> to have something in, in one of those areas. But I think that in terms of like a business opportunity, there are so many areas um, that just like even microclimates, but specific regions, the Midwest, the South, the Southeast, where there is a lack of charming kind of innovative, architecturally distinct experiences yes. like that. And also that, that correspond to a large metro area of people that are hungry for those kind of yes. experiences. Yes. And if you can find that perfect, I call it the Goldilocks zone of like two, two to two and a half hour radius from a large metro area. And then just, even if it's like a super boring place, <laughs> um, no offense, but like say Nebraska or something, you find some area that has some trees are a huge, um, a, a huge part of the draw, I think, but find something that's unique. In my case, there were these incredible trees and there was this little cow pond, but I saw, look, we could expand it. We could reshape the the ground and create some topography and really create an, a super attractive, like oasis in the middle of kind of some blah landscape to be frank. And yeah. sure enough, that's what happened. And then those people, you know, being in, in Waco is just awesome because we're right in the middle of the Texas triangle. It's 23 plus million people. And so you have this incredible market that's just built in ready, but yeah, find places that are off the beaten path that do align with a large population area and have a vision that you know is going to resonate. That's different. And one last piece on, on, uh, what it takes. I think that, you know, a lot of people talk about high barrier to entry markets. And so they're looking for like these 
really expensive and highly regulated places, which basically mean you're going to have to work really hard to get entitlements and approval from the local jurisdictions, or you're going to have to buy some distressed asset that you can fix up or whatever. There's a, there's a whole movement around like, um, roadside motels, which I think is great. There's some really cool concepts yeah. renovating yeah. those. But again, my take is I'm my barrier to entry is going to be by creating and executing this vision that really is like completely unique and one of a kind. And then yes, yeah, somebody could technically go buy a piece of land next to me and build it. But the chances are they're not going to, because for one, like I'm already going to sort of be owning that market and I'm going to have the first mover advantage. So I'm going to build a social media audience around it, which is another huge part of, of my model and your model too, I know. And then that's, that's a huge moat because then you have, you control, you own, you have a platform. And um, yeah. so I don't look for regulation, high regulation and, you know, high barrier to entry markets in that sense, I'm going to create the moat around me with the amenities, with the experience, with the overall vibe and kind of brand that you're creating with, with the property. Yeah. And I will say something that you've proven and others are proving right now is that there's a huge demand for this. And so I don't think about competition in the same way in our market, because I think there's so many people who are craving these experiences that if someone else were to create it in a different place, they're just able to allow more people to have that experience. But I want to go back to the financial piece because I think you're right. I think that's a big block for a lot of people and a big reason why a lot of people start with one cabin to prove the concept and like dip their toes in. Because, you know, some people can afford the down payment for one cabin and then start renting it and then make money and then grow from there. But you went all in. You weren't like, oh, I'm going to create one cabin and just test it out and see how it goes. You were like, no, I'm going to buy a piece of land and do seven at once. First of all, how did you afford that financially? And then what did you learn from that experience of going all in versus just kind of dipping your toe in and growing slowly? Yeah. So for just a little bit of context, I was 24 years old and I had about $25,000 of savings. And I had this idea, this dream that I just was sold out for. I, I totally believed in it. It was, yeah, a lot of risk, but I, I just had that feeling like this is going to work. And when I found the property, I started to like do re market research a little bit and kind of like bring my ideas together and kind of like a vision board, but nothing super definitive, just kind of like ideas really. And what year was this? Can you take us back to a place in time? This is 20 early 2021. So okay. we we're just kind of like coming out of COVID in Texas, we just just kind of coming out of lockdowns and nobody even really knew like if travel was going to explode. There was definitely writing on the wall that, you know, by the time everybody was fully out and able to travel, I had a feeling that people were going to want it, but it was a little bit unproven. And of course, Airbnb had just taken a massive hit. Uh -huh. So, Oh, I remember on, those years well. <laughs> a little untested, but um, I started looking for property and probably looked for about two months and it all came together one morning, I just opened up Zillow like I had pretty much every other morning for the pr previous months <laughs> and found this place that had been listed literally hours before it was five acres just down the road from my house. And I'd driven past this place like probably a hundred plus times, but I had never thought anything of it because it was just kind of like briars and I couldn't really see back, back behind there. But the listing photo was a drone photo and I could see this little body of water and like some, what appear to be some large trees. So I was like, Oh, this looks really intriguing. So I was over there that day. And the moment I've said this before, but I'll keep saying again, the moment I walked on site, it was, it's impossible to articulate. I just had this feeling that was as strong as any feeling like that, that this is the place to build. And I could just picture that dream of those cabins nestled around the water and the reflections. I mean, I literally had a vision. Like I could see exactly what it was going to be. And so that we were under contract that day to close in 30 days. Wow. And wait, 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 take us back. You only had $25,000 yeah. in your bank so account. So I got under contract because you... I knew that property was going to go fast. And so then I was like, I'll figure out the finances part after I get under contract. Okay. That's right. Because <laughs> you don't need to prove finances in order to go under contract. No. Yeah. You ha I had 30 days and I had an option period. So I could, you know, I could back out with a couple thousand dollars maximum risk. And then I got on the phone and I, called my dad up and my dad and brothers have a small construction business in Idaho. That's where I mentioned I grew up working mm -hmm. and I figured like maybe they could give me a short term loan to get the land at least. Um, and they were like, okay, we'll, we'll figure something out here. Cause we, we think this is a good idea, but, um, 
the terms were pretty undefined. So I, I at least knew, okay, we got something to work with. Then I started talking to banks and I pounded the pavement hard. I talked to a lot of local banks and through- Were you first, looking I mean, for personal mortgages or small business loans or what were you looking for? Construction loan for, construction loans, okay. yeah, based off of a, a pro forma that, you know, that took an income approach. So I wanted to actually pencil out first, obviously the, the costs I was predicting, but then the income and expenses I was projecting, but I was, I didn't even use AirDNA or any kind of like hard data for those numbers. I talked with a couple of folks that owned Airbnbs in the area and kind of penciled in a, um, a, a range of rates and occupancies that seemed realistic to me. And we underwrote it actually, again, we, there were so many unknowns. The way we designed the cabins, they, they have, there's five two bedroom and two one bedroom. And they're about 550 square feet a piece. We did a micro chef's kitchen, closets, and washer and dryer in each unit. So the thinking was, if worst case scenario, this tourism bet doesn't work out, we can we can rent we these can out rent long term. Them. Yeah. So that's how we underwrote it on like the low end conservative side to just just to be safe. And the bank liked that, and they liked the upside of the tourism model. And I got told no, but then I found a bank that. Um, that agreed to take a risk on it. They said 80% of the appraised value they would loan as a construction loan, 12 to 18 months interest only, five and a half percent, wherever we were, yeah, in that at that part of the cycle. And so then I had to come up with the equity, the, the remaining equity of however much it was going to cost. So fast forward, it ended up costing us 2.3 million to build and the initial appraisal was 1.8. So we got a loan wow. for like 1.5 and then we had to cover like $800,000. So the only way we were able to do that, and there were a lot of moving pieces to, to bring this together, but eventually I... I wanted to get like a high interest, hard money loan from my my dad and my brother's construction business in the short term because I didn't want to give away any equity. But they they believed in the idea too much and they insisted on equity. So they took 40% <laughs> in exchange for the temporary funding until we could refinance. And the way we did it is they actually, so we all pooled like personal savings um, and I actually built a spec home, a seven hundred fifty thousand dollars spec home, at the same time because the spec home market was just raging in Texas at that time, and made about one hundred and sixty thousand on that. I built it in four and a half months, sold it, made a hundred. Oh my gosh! And pushed pushed that straight into the project, which we needed every penny of it. But basically, we all scraped together, and then they used a line of credit. So, of, of actual equity, we were only we were only probably coming up with less than a hundred thousand between all of us. But most of it was through a line of business line of credit they had access to that was, again, creative because you can't keep a project like that on the books for a long period of time. Um, right. So I, it was a lot of risk. And I knew we're, we, we need to refinance this thing as soon as we possibly can, which just meant we need to build this thing as soon as we can so we can get it up yes. and running and get cash flow. Right. So we designed and built the whole thing in nine and a half months, start to finish. It was, and I built that spec all seven at the same time, all seven. So you so, had all seven. So you would have like framers come in and just do all the framing. Exactly. For seven so there were a lot of scale economies because we were, yeah. which is a big advantage of going the multi-unit route. But to specifically answer your question on that, we could, I played with different models doing like five. First it was going to, I was never going to do one cabin. I, I definitely wanted the village kind of feeling. I thought about doing five and I thought about doing nine and then kind of found the middle ground. And what, where I landed on seven was really, it was more just like intuitive walking the site and sort of feeling out what would be good spacing and what are the specific locations on this yeah. specific piece of property that makes sense to put a cabin. Yeah. So it was very much defined by the land, the piece of land we were working with as the given. That makes sense. Where but, did you... Oh, okay, go ahead. Keep going. I was just going to say, we ended up utilizing, so it's 5.1 acres. We used every square foot of it. So we spaced them out generously and then did a commons area and then had like a back of house area with a uh, laundry facility and such, but we used every bit of it. So there was not like any expansion uh, possibility. And so in, in that sense, again, it was a huge bet. One big factor, because I knew that the multi, I wanted to do multi-unit at least eventually, one big factor in choosing to go all in was... Um, if you on a smaller piece of property like that, um, I guess it's all relative. There's definitely smaller pieces, but if you do a phased approach, a downside of a phased approach is once you get, let's say you, I was to build three cabins in phase one and then another four in phase two. Well, once you get the three up and running and you get people coming, 
it's yep. going to be a huge disruption on a smaller piece of property like yes. that to bring to have construction going on. The whole brand and concept of this property was serenity and just like being lost in yes. nature. So again, it yes. was it was a huge risk, but it was a gut thing. I was like, I I feel like this is going to work. And again, just sort of like intuitively and anecdotally thinking of all of these different people, you know, 20 plus million people, I was like, surely there's going to be enough population. Now, if you want right. my my uh, hot take on it. I think I could build another hundred units if they were differentiated enough in this specific area without really seeing much saturation because I see the hunger and like, we're just in the early innings of the experiential hospitality revolution. There are so there's such a deep hunger in my generation, especially that craves these authentic one of a kind experiences that yeah. transport them. So when you go to live Oak Lake, it doesn't feel like you're in Texas and that's what people love. Right. It feels like, you're in this mm, other world. I like that. Yeah, this idea of transportation. No one has ever said it quite like that because I always ask what makes a cabin a cabin, but I feel like that's part of it. Even if it's only an hour away, you want to feel like you are someplace entirely different so that you can kind of shut off all the things that happen in your day-to-day -day life and really allow yourself to be somewhere completely different. That's Interesting. It. So you think the market is that strong? Is that because in your area there's so little saturation? You're the only one doing this, or you just think there's that many people? I think that, to be honest, like cream rises to the top. And so let me just say this: I think Airbnb like revolutionized the accommodations and hospitality industry. Right? Like they they totally turned it on its head because yeah, there used to be bed and breakfasts like very very you know scattered and um like uh, completely un uh unscaled and unpredictable and with no marketing and just like no it, that concept has been there for a long time and i in places like europe it's actually a lot more developed than it was in the us but when airbnb came on the scene they essentially like created the possibility for people like me um, and other people that didn't grow up in the hospitality industry that didn't have a lot yeah. of resources, maybe, and maybe you would say, okay, I, I had a lot of resources. So I had access to capital, uh, essentially, like I hear that a lot and I get it. Like, yes, I would say my childhood and the experience of working in construction and just all of those things, more intangible things that were imparted to me were much more valuable than access to capital through the family. I would have found that money somewhere. I, I really believe. And again, I think anyone can, everybody has a network and if they have that passion and they have that vision, they're going to attract the capital. But I think that- I do think it's helpful to acknowledge that though. I try and acknowledge a lot that I inherited the money that started mine just because I do think sometimes yeah. it can feel no, overwhelming I completely for agree. folks who don't I completely have access agree. to that. I completely yeah. agree. Um, but Airbnb changed the game. And so there's a lot of, they took a lot of people that weren't in the industry that all of a sudden had their eyes open to the opportunity to Airbnb their place. And maybe they didn't create a really cool cabin initially, but then they saw the, the benefits of it and the best ones created super cool, unique experiences. And Airbnb intentionally pushed that, like the whole OMG fund and categories and yep. all that. Yep. And they basically created a bunch of little micro hoteliers is the way I see it. And, yeah. and so then those people go out and have this opportunity to build these little, these properties. And eventually, I mean, like little empires. And, and if they do it right with social media, they can build a platform around it. And eventually Airbnb can kind of take a back seat. But, um, I feel like in Texas and really across the board, um, there are, and not to sound arrogant because I, there's a lot of people that are executing at a much higher level than I did. But again, like not everyone has it. Ha what is it has the vision of, again, like creating that vibe, creating a transportive kind of experience. Yeah. And those that can are, there's such an opportunity. So yes, we're seeing oversaturation generally in Airbnbs and obviously kind of like a counter Re a reactionary movement where, you know, people like as a whole, like mass market shifted from staying in hotels to going to Airbnbs, but then they saw these yeah. quality and inconsistency um, yeah. issues with Airbnbs. And so now there's actually kind of a reaction. The pendulum just swings back and forth back to hotels, yeah. but yep. you can like stay totally above the fray by creating something that's again, one of a kind, experiential, completely unique and building a, a platform around it. And so for if you're going to execute that playbook, there is so much opportunity 
virtually anywhere you go. And Instagram, yeah. I think people are really catching on now, but Instagram is still highly underutilized as a booking channel for people. So yeah. not just a place to post cool photos of your cabin, but to optimize for converting to bookings and creating an, a content engine around that, that, um, and, and obviously having the, the backend structure and, um, collateral, like a, a direct bookings website and great messaging and, um, all of, all of those pieces that come more on like the operations <laughs> and marketing side. But yeah, the opportunity is, is huge. I think that it would work in Texas. There's a ton of other people doing it well in Texas and I know <laughs> most of them. And again, like the best ones aren't seeing it virtually any um saturation yet there's obviously going to be a point somewhere and i'm very cognizant of that but um i'm again looking to create things that truly are it, it becomes such a cliche but w a friend of mine says one of one i almost like that better than one of a kind that means like there's no there's nothing else like that and yeah there's there's a whole generation of of the of the builders and the hosts but there are so many ideas to create that still haven't been created. Yes. Yes. Okay. I have two follow-up questions on that. Um, going back a little bit earlier, you said you think sometimes people either have it or don't and that you had this vision. Do you think that it can be teachable? Because you've just launched a masterclass or you're getting ready to launch it in just a couple of weeks, which tells me you think that there's some teachable elements to this. But from what I heard, it also sounds like you think there is something inherent. So by it, I mean both the vision, but also the hosting and the hospitality side. Do you think it's teachable? <laughs> That's a great question. So let me be completely honest. I, again, like going back just to touch on the vision part of it, I, I don't think that everybody... I think that 99% of people can appreciate the kind of experience that I'm talking about, but they're not all going to be able to obviously create it or pinpoint exactly what it is. I think it's, it's the culmination of, you know, let's just say design, let's single out design and that element. Um, I like to say that's, uh, the biggest lever that you can pull in creating an yes. experience, creating a one of a kind destination. I it's the, it's the biggest amenity as well, but I think it goes beyond that. There's the hospitality element where you, again, you either have it or you don't. And that's not a bad, it's not like a bad thing or a good thing. Some people are, you know, <laughs> have incredible like talents that I don't have. And I'm sure I'm not the most hospitable person either, but I definitely love people <laughs> and I love connecting like at my, at my core. And so I think yeah. the, the, the heart and soul of hospitality is wanting to serve people, wanting to connect with people, wanting to delight and surprise them. Mm, and I definitely yes. have that. So that's a personal question. I, as far as the technical aspects of service and hospitality and like, again, like engineering the stay and from the direct bookings to the, um, you know, this, we used a lot of smart home tech and, uh, yep. the pricing tech and automated messaging and the, you know, getting the cleaners systematized and the maintenance, all of those, of course you can teach all of that. That's, um, a relatively straightforward playbook, honestly. Um, when it comes to, again, the hospitality and the bigger picture vision and like, yeah. And then of course, executing on that vision. I think yeah. that you can give a framework for it, but it really is something that I, I don't think is cut. Everyone is cut out for. I think everyone's cut out to appreciate it, but not everyone's cut out to do it. Mm, and so I'm not trying yes. to like, I'm just trying to like, assist and help those that want it, that feel it burning inside of them. And a That's lot of right. the people that I've found already have Airbnbs. They're already operating on some level, but they see the, again, like kind of the Airbnb bust uh, phenomenon where they're losing, um, they're losing bookings and they realize they're not standing out against um, the competition, whether that's their other Airbnbs or hotels. And so in a lot of cases, it's, it means like, taking the experience they have, but completely built, rebuilding from the ground up in terms of the actual stay or the portfolio or whatever. Yeah. And you don't have to build something purpose built from the ground up. I think, again, you can go going back to the stay. Like if you find, I would love to find something actually like one idea I've seen other people doing well is, um, like taking old summer camps or, um, uh, of course, I mentioned the roadside motel thing that are completely run down and then rethinking them and 
breathing new life into them from the ground up. And the opportunity yeah. there is twofold. You have so much character and personality and already built into the property, but the most like the most compelling aspect of that is, and this applies to anyone, but especially an opportunity like that is you can tell the story in such a yes. compelling way. It's, everybody loves redemption and like um, renovation stories like that. And the way, the best way to do that to, to, is to tell the story publicly through Instagram and social media. And again, like there's some really great examples of this. I have a friend and it doesn't just apply to those. So I'll, I'll give you two examples. One, from a guy named Devin. You may know Devin. His property is called the Pacific Ben. Yeah, and, we had him on the podcast very early on. Okay, very cool. So I don't need to give you context, but basically he built a million plus followers just in the process of building this really epic shipping container structure in the woods in Washington state. And people loved it. Like he was a great storyteller and just created all these like cool yeah. reels, a lot of like before and after, a lot of time lapses. And people felt like they were following along. He's very authentic. And he's a great storyteller. And yeah. so there's, and then when he launched, I think he told me within like a week or maybe two weeks of launching with this huge email list and all of these followers on social, he had like 70% occupancy booked out like a year in advance just from the built in following he had created. So, yep. And then there's another example. Um, there is, well, there's actually a few, but on Instagram, uh, that you've probably seen these where again, they're taking like a summer camp or they're taking an old ski resort that was like closed down yeah. and they're rebuilding yeah. it. And it's such a cool story. People love yeah. to follow that. So tell your story we, no matter what you're doing. <laughs> that's right. We had just do it. Amanda on who's doing that with a motel in yes. Wyoming yep. uh, a couple episodes ago. And I've been following her forever, just following along on this cool adventure. Cause it's something that I haven't seen done before. How were you thinking about social media like you said something a minute ago that, you know, there's such an opportunity for social media to be more than just pretty pictures. And I do, I follow a ton of cabin accounts and I do see they tend to fit into one of three camps. One is I clearly don't know how to use social media. I'm going to post occasionally and maybe it's for current guests. Another one is I know how to use social media and I'm going to share my story and really maximize that. I think Devin's a great example of that. And then there's this third camp where it's like, I don't know if they're doing it or they're hiring someone, but it's just a whole bunch of like, oh, tag someone that you'd stay here with that do quite well. And I'm not saying that's not a good approach. What was your thought? What was your strategy going in? Because it sounds like you had thought about this as a way to drive bookings very early on. How were you thinking yeah. about it strategically? This is one of my favorite stories to tell. So we we finished the property. I knew direct bookings would be important in the journey, but I intentionally chose to launch on Airbnb because I knew they would boost my account for the first like the, the listings for the first month or so. Yeah. So we get everything up and live, and I finally took a moment to breathe after that crazy nine and a half months. Oh my God, I can't imagine the project. <laughs> and we were getting like great reviews coming in, and um, like two and a half weeks after launching, I wake up one morning and my Airbnb account is completely shut down. It's every listing is suspended. There had been no Why? warning. And, it was crazy and I could not, I got a whole, finally got a hold of customer service. They were entirely unhelpful. They said, we don't know. Um, it's under review. That's a department that operates independently. It was so frustrating. And this is everyone's biggest fear right here. I, know, it, it, I, I had heard of this, but I was like, you know, that's just kind of like the crazy outlier story. And it happened to me. Guess what? It happened twice. But let me tell you about the first time. So the whole thing suspended. So I just went, I got frantic and I started calling everyone who knew anything about social media because I didn't. And I got this lady who's phenomenal. Her name is Amanda Spencer. She's a travel influencer in Texas. And she was like, Hey, I'll come out and do it, but it's going to be a few months before I can get to it. Um, but here's an account in Dallas nearby that you should see if, if they'll run something right away. So I quickly threw together a direct bookings website and launched an account and, you know, posted some photos. And then I contacted this account and they said, sure, we'll run a giveaway for $950. And three days later, without even coming to the property, I sent them photos. They posted the giveaway. And within like seven days, within like a week, it was like a five day giveaway, a two night stay. We grew like 5,000 followers from scratch and got 40 plus thousand dollars of direct bookings from nothing from this one giveaway that I spent $950 on. Do you and think it I was, was just, 
it was fine. It feels to me like finding the right audience, like the right account who has your audience. I got really that. lucky. Is that true? Because yes, there's a it's there's like landmines everywhere in the influencer field. Like finding the ones that are yeah, first of all, like actually legit and have a good following. They didn't that they didn't buy, but then also yeah, finding the right fit that overlaps with those that will be interested in your stay. Right. Um, I got super lucky. I think another big thing was. Again, that was like the first exposure we ever got. And so again, it was a truly unique experience. We had been successful in creating that, but nobody else had highlighted it yet. So yeah. you get that first mover advantage again. So yep. at that moment, we went all in and it was literally the biggest blessing being suspended because like days after that, we actually got restored and they basically had said, oh, there was a glitch and our algorithm thought that you were getting fake reviews. And so they just shut the whole thing down. you were getting so many. I was getting a ton, exactly. And so at that point though, the timing couldn't have been more perfect because like I was on fire with the direct bookings thing. And I, I mean, we were on our way. So we went all in the first six months. And this was right at the moment when Instagram as a platform was pivoting to reels. Again, trying to compete with TikTok. Yeah, yeah. We went all in on these giveaways and I was posting mainly photos, but on just the the backs of these giveaways, we grew about 50,000 followers in the first six months. And I probably spent $25,000 on those partnerships and gave away, gave away a bunch of free nights. So I invested heavily, but- Okay, that's good to hear though. Because I think a lot of people want Instagram growth to happen magically or the marketing growth to happen magically. No, and you can, there are some stories, but yes, yep. I think people do need to hear that. It will cost a little bit. But- um I realized pretty soon that that was great, but it wasn't going to be a sustainable way to grow the audience. So we were getting a ton of bookings. It was perfect because we were just launching. So there was a lot of occupancy that afforded me to give away these nights yep. in a way that didn't cost me as much. But I, um, I realized we need to start creating good content. So I, I did some experimentation. And one thing I'll mention with influencers is if you find the right creators that let's say they have only like 5,000 followers, but they're really talented at creating content. Well, maybe you don't partner with them to distribute to their audience because it's not valuable, but maybe you just have let them stay again. You've got occupancy and or vacancy, I'm sorry. And you get them to create some great like four or five reels that you can post from your account. They'll maybe yeah. already be familiar with different formats that work, which will teach you something and it's not easy to create good content. So that's something we did a lot of early on. Like all the photography too for live, pretty much all the photography for Live Oak Lake, I didn't pay for. I just had like all these photographers reaching out, amateur photographers are like, this is such a cool place. I want to shoot it. And then I yeah. took the best, kind of like cherry picked the best shots from all of them and then used that for all of our marketing. But yeah. Then I do so, think amateur photographers are underused. I think I, I also use really well-known photographers that we pay a lot for. Totally worth it. Totally but I do agreed. think the newer ones really want to prove something, really need an opportunity, and it can be win-win for both folks if you're just training vacant nights for photos. And then you can just pick. Then the stakes are lower. Like, okay, if I get a handful of good photos from this, great, worth it. Whereas when you pay $2,000 for someone, like you need all of them to be good to, worth, to be worth that investment. I've worked now since um, having a little bit more cash to spend. I've hired an architectural photographer actually on another project on this office studio that I just built, but that is so worth it. It was like 4,000 bucks, but it is so worth it. Like the photos are phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, you can be scrappy and bootstrap it when you're just starting with a property. But to answer your question about content, I ended up experimenting, like created a bunch of it myself, but then I found a, do you know Nate with Content House? Mm -mm. So there was a guy named Shelby Wilray who kind of had a following in the short term. I know that space. name. Yeah. So Shelby reached out and said, Hey, or like posted a story and said, Hey, I'm taking on a few more clients. And so I got on a call and he had a partner at the time named Nate. And now they actually do separate things. Um, they do pretty much the same thing, but they do it separately. Anyway, I actually hired those guys and Nate has been awesome. And they start, they started when we were about 40 or 50,000 followers and they took it from there to where we are today, which is like 160,000 plus just on creating great content, posting consistently. They kind of, you know, they watch the algorithm. So they'll see if there's changes like in the styles and trending audios and whatnot, but it's really just a consistency game. They post yeah. every other day. They come out and shoot like three times a year, bulk shoot, and then edit it 
and post every other day. So it, wow, it's a good so process. that includes them coming out and collecting content. You don't even have to do that. I don't have to do any of it. The only thing I was doing, which we sold Live Oak Lake, so I'm not doing any of it anymore. But um, the only thing that I was doing was um, uh, going on stories and kind of maintaining that personal connection as the face of the brand, really. And I think that's also yeah. important. Again, like there's so many touch points, physical touch points, and like the the automated messaging for the guests after they book that I put a lot of thought into um, really trying to keep that personal connection as strong as possible. Yes. So like putting our story in the welcome book, making a really great custom yeah. welcome book, putting our story in that, the welcome gift, the like the handwritten note and the Instagram stories and the emails and all of it. Cause it's very easy to come across when you start operating at scale, it's very easy to come across as just like a company and people hate companies. Yes. They like yes. brands. That's not what they're looking for. They hate companies. They like brands and they love people. So just like put mm. yourself into the brand and it can be a brand, but put yourself into it. And, um, I think that's why, again, going back to the storytelling piece, like the founder led kind of like behind the scenes, even like really raw way of telling the story as you go, sharing the wins, sharing the losses, deeply yes. resonates with people and yes they want to follow I love that this yes i have never heard that before but people wait you might have to say it for me one more time they they hate big businesses they like brands but they love people is that what you said they hate i think they hate companies they like brands they but they love people <laughs> Okay. That's honestly why I've shied away from doing too much branded stuff in our cabin. Like when you get to our cabin, there's almost nothing that other than our guest book, nothing else has Cozy Rock on it. Like we don't have branded anything because I want it to just feel like, oh, this is our cabin that we're sharing with you. And it's not even necessarily, it's just two humans who love this place and want to share it with you. And I do, I think branding can be really powerful, but I'm also just a little bit nervous about getting away from the individual. Okay. But wait, Isaac, you slipped something in there like very quickly and then just like went right by it. You said we sold Live Oaks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you not, have you not followed the story? You may have not known that. So no, no. On Oct so basically we got we, we had this like huge success with the operation. So we and I've been very transparent, I'll tell you the numbers. So we um we grew, like I said, about 150,000 followers and we grossed a million dollars our first year and net around five hundred and fifty thousand top line uh, before interest um our first year. So it was crazy for a seven unit property, ninety-five percent occupancy, like eighty percent direct bookings because of that Instagram audience. Yeah. And we just got, I got inundated with offers and people wanting to buy and people wanting to invest. And we built it to keep it's, it was a really hard decision, but we got an offer last year that was just too good to pass up. So, um, we actually sold it. We sold it for $7 million. So a million bucks a Holy key. Shit. Um, and again, like that, a big part of that was having that Instagram following and the email list and, and then just having a, a turnkey property. But yeah, yeah. it's like a, a private equity style group that wanted to, wants to expand the brand and wanted to leverage that following and such. So we sold everything That's last hard October. to say no to. It's really hard to say no. And I've learned so much. It'll always be like my baby. I, I learned, I learned everything about hosting that I know from that project, but, um, I'm really excited to find another opportunity and do another project that I can employ all of the lessons and even the mistakes that I made into the new, you know, the, the learnings from those mistakes and and employ that in the new project. So, um, and now you have some funds to do it without having yeah, it to was like quite a wild ride. I mean, in just that fast, like there was such intensity and speed and executing, and then just like again yeah. selling and everything. But the timing really was perfect. Like it felt like the right thing to do and. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting to be able to show people, look, and I, again, I've been like super transparent. This is, these were the challenges, but this was the unbelievable opportunity. This is how it actually worked. These are the numbers we made and we actually sold it. It's like the full life cycle of the deal. And again, like that just makes the case for the fact that big institutions like private equity is desperate to find properties like this and this whole experiential hospitality movement, but they can't operate hardly even on like a property by property basis, certainly not on like a right. one unit by unit basis. But if you can assemble a portfolio and again, like have the systems in place with the operating, with management, with the social media and marketing, then it's super compelling for them. And they want to get, they want to get a piece of the pie. So again, like the opportunity is huge for like mom and pop 
investors and and hosts and ho- really, like I said, many hoteliers that can create experiences like this. And it, it doesn't mean you have to sell them. It's a generational kind of asset. Like you could pass that down right. to your kids. Right. One of the best parts, like do, maybe you resonate with this too, but like besides the money, the money is great. Like it has been very financially rewarding, but I think the best part of the whole thing is just the feeling and the sense of like, I don't know, pride that you feel in a good way of owning like a little oasis, a little retreat that you can take, you can take your partner, you could take your friends and family. And like when we first opened Live Oak before we started doing any of this, really, it was like our soft opening. I invited my whole family and I've got a big family. I've got nine siblings and grandparents and from all over the country came together the whole family and stayed because it was all seven units for like three nights. We had this beautiful family reunion. It was the first time in many, many years, the whole family had been together. And there was just such a great feeling of like having your own place to do that. And again, like the sense of this, the sense of reward. You built this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And to be like, I built this, I created this. Yes. We had our wedding at our cabin, which we did not know we were going to do when we built it. Uh, we were planning to get married in Mexico and then because of COVID it got canceled. And so we ended up hosting our closest family and friends at the cabin. And then we had a lake day at our other cabin up the road, two hours up the road, a couple days before. And I very much had that feeling of just like, oh, this intrinsic comp- compensation is better than any amount of money we're making off of it. But like, I built That's this. It. We did this. Yep. Yeah. I completely agree. Oh. So. That was the best part of the whole journey, honestly. And I can't wait to do it again because that's intangible. You can't really buy that. And again, like on the next property, I really am going to be like super picky as far as like selling. I think it was the right decision on the first one, but I want to create a portfolio of these properties that I can can really be like part of our legacy and and my kids can grow up working in. And there's so many lessons in hospitality that even though we I didn't come from a hospitality background like officially. We were already always in hospitality. My my family was always hosting other people. We um, now my parents actually do have a couple really cool Airbnbs. Like they renovated a train car. It's actually featured on the TV show. It's really cool. Um, and we and have they a did small, this after you. Y- yes. Well, I, actually, nope. Actually, I helped them on that project um, during COVID. So it was in 2020. Okay. Okay. And so, but we we hadn't hosted. It was like this massive renovation. It's really cool. You should actually look it up. It's called. Uh, w I and M three Oh six. It's a funny name. If you send me that link, we'll put it in the show notes. So anyone listening, it's, you can just check out the show notes and we'll have a link to it. It's really cool. It's featured on the Magnolia network, but a total I was going to say, it sounds like familiar. <laughs> old train car that was literally completely rot, rotted out, but it's perfectly restored. And now they've done like a depot and a caboose and all these other pieces of the pie. Yes. But anyway, hospitality yes. is such a great environment to, to raise a family to, again, like it's, if, if you're a people person to be able to connect with people like that and have a place for people to come. And, and like, I like to say, it's more than a place for them to stay. It's an experience. It's something that they're full of these like magical moments that they're going to take away as memories and create traditions around. We had people that came back to live Oak, I think four times in a 12 month period and brought like friends and family with them because yes. it was, again, such a unique, one-of-a-kind experience. And that's deeply, deeply rewarding. Yes. Yes. So can you tell folks, because you've talked a lot about experiential hosting, and I know you have a masterclass coming out very soon all about experiential hosting. Can you tell folks what that is, where they can find it, what they can expect for anyone who's been really inspired by your story and journey and might want to learn a bit more? Sure. Where would they do that? Yeah, so um, we create. I've created a top to bottom blueprint for the whole process from design, concept, building, um, permitting if if necessary, um, hosting, self management. So like putting all the tech pieces together, and then the marketing, social media, email, pretty much all aspects of it. Into it's about eleven hours of highly produced content. We shot it at Live Oak Lake before we sold it, so it's really cool to be able to show it and not just tell it. And yeah. I brought in a panel of experts to kind of help complement it, you know, on a whole range of topics that whose knowledge was greater than mine. How to raise private capital, um, kind of all the pieces. So that's experientialhospitality.com. You can join the waitlist there and. 
I actually just built a personal site that has a portfolio of um, all of my projects now and has access to the course. It's isaacjfrench.com. You can sign up for a newsletter that I send out weekly and share a ton of value for free there um, if you're not ready to take the course. Um, and then I want to mention too, I just recently built this community around the course. So it's full of like, it's not just course members, but it's also, um, a bunch of friends. In fact, I'd love to get you in there and you could at least just check it out, but friends that are already hosting and operating at a high level, it's kind of like an elite peer group where you can share knowledge, ask questions, get expert feedback. And so I'm really, really excited. Selfishly, it's like my favorite thing because every day I get to interact with these folks and learn something yeah. and we do live calls. Where is that? Stuff. Is that on Facebook? No, it's, we built out our own thing. So it's, we have an, our own mobile app and everything. So I went all in with it. I don't like to do things halfway. Um, Clearly. And we have like shared resources, my underwriting model, like somebody just posted yesterday, a whole list of vetted vendors that they use. And I've got a list as well. So we're building out kind of like a vendor database for everything from web design to, you know, branding to um, models and financial underwriting, all, all kinds of aspects like that. So uh, IsaacJFrench.com is my personal site. And then you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at IsaacFrench underscore. And then is the app where the community is, is it called Experiential Hospitality? Yep. Experiential okay. Hospitality. Um, it's on the app store. Now you have to be registered to get into it. So, but uh, for your listeners oh, only. Oh, so this is if you sign up for the masterclass. Yes. So let me okay. tell you this. Um, I wasn't even planning this, but for your listeners only, um, if if you got, if there are hosts out there that want to sort of level up the whole game here, create a multi-unit, it doesn't have to be multi-unit, but kind of execute the same playbook as Live Oak Lake. Um, I will give you 20% off um, for a limited time. Just reach out to me personally. My email is i at isaacjfrench.com and I'll get you hooked up. But yeah, I think the- Wait, wait, can you repeat again, that email? It's just the letter I at IsaacJFrench.com. The letter I at IsaacJFrench.com. Okay, that feels like one of the most badass email addresses I've heard in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I so. at my name. Okay, perfect. So you folks heard it here. You can check out everything on the website so you can see exactly what's in there. And that launches, was it July 10th? Did I make that up in my head? So we actually launched it. Our first launch was last July. So then we shut it down and we've done a couple successive launches, but I've been super selective. And again, my intention with the course was not to like make the most money I could. I'm trying to curate like the best group of people and have hold their hand and follow through to the best outcomes and experiences. Yeah. I had a lot of reticence to do a course in the first place because I feel like there's so many courses out there and there's honestly like like these gurus that just basically want to make money off of it. And I did not want to be seen as that and kind of like ruin my reputation at all. So I took some flack, but just from, you know, some of the haters when I first did it, but the results that have come back from the, the members and sort of being so selective has paid dividends. Cause it's again, like super rewarding to be able to help people on their journey and network with them. I don't feel like there's a lot of community ar around hosting on this level and with Agreed. this model. So I'm trying Agreed. to help fix that. Yeah. I think Instagram has helped with that and people have formed their own little communities within it. And Facebook groups, I think were the original place for community for hosts. And they became such a, a negative place for like complaining. And like, again, I think it's similar to the Airbnb model where there's just like a lot of inconsistency in it. So when you find host communities, there tends to be a lot of inconsistency in how we're thinking about hosting. So something like this with that name, experiential hospitality, really, I think kind of creates a filter for the kind of host that it might attract, which is what's needed. That's exactly it. That's That yeah. was my hope. So I'm glad it makes yeah. sense. Isaac, this was so great to talk to you. I love your ambition and the way you just like went after this all in from, from start until where you are now. I'm excited to see where you go next. Um, thank you for joining us and sharing all that. Janice, I've actually been a big fan for a long time and need to get out and stay at your place sometime, but it's, it's an honor. Thanks for having me on. Thanks so much for joining us. And if you liked what you heard, feel free to leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or share some of your favorite parts over on Apple podcast. If you have feedback or suggestions for the future, you can also find me on Instagram at Cozy Rock Cabin. Looking forward to next week.